she's like, Didi, wait, look at me. Oh my gosh, you're so cute. Hates it. <laughs> she had a long day. She had a very exciting game yesterday. All right, what's good, everybody? My name is Alex, and welcome to Higa's Playbook, the show that talks about sports, dating, and all things life as a Seattle girl living in the Bay. Oh, we're going to talk about Week 15, the Seahawks versus the Eagles. This was a Monday night football game. It was a huge, huge game for so many parties, including 49ers fans. We'll get into that in a little bit, but it was a Monday night football game. We watched the game. We usually go to Danny Coyle's, but we went to the Olympia Company down in Oakland across the Bay Bridge. We went over the bridge. How long did it take us? Don't even ask. It was rush hour traffic. It literally took us probably almost an hour, right, to get to the Olympia Company. And it should be like a 20-minute drive. But we made it. My friend Alex owns the company with E40, and we made a lovely bet. The commanders played the Seahawks earlier in the season, and he called me up. He was like, hey, we need to make a bet. And I was like, let's go. And he's like, okay, if I win, I want smoked salmon from Seattle. And I was like, cool. And he's like, what do you want if you win? And I was like, hmm. A Seahawks party at your shop. <laughs> I was very, very confident. And the Seahawks did beat the commanders. So he held up his end of the bet. Not only did he host a Monday night football game on a day when he's usually closed on the shop. So thank you so much, Alex, for that. But he also created a Seattle Lumpia, which had smoked salmon, cream cheese, capers and it was topped with a honey mustard sauce as well as everything bagel seasoning and he also put fixed sriracha sauce on the side to dip it in if you are from seattle you know what a seattle dog is those late nights after the club after the bar you go to the hot dog stand but not only do they give you the option to have grilled onions you get cream cheese on your hot dog and if you've never had it you're missing out so this cream cheese with the smoked salmon was mm, it was so nostalgic and so delicious. But we didn't just get lumpia. We got some wings. I believe they were the garlic parmesan adobo wings. We also got this other thing that was pretty much chicken. If you've ever had juk before, it's like a Chinese rice porridge. But this one had so much more flavor because it also had bone marrow in it. It was so good. We shared it as a table. And if so, if you ever go to the Olympia Company, don't forget to get all the Olympia. Don't forget to get all the wings and ask for the thing that is like juk. <laughs> I'll find the name of it later. It was just such a good environment. My friends came who aren't even Seahawks fans. They're mostly actually we all had a team from the NFC West. We had some Rams fans. We had some Niners fans. It was great. I think it was the game that I had the most support from people in the Bay because if the Seahawks won, which we did, it helps out the Niners, and we'll talk about that later. Whew. All right. This game gave me so much anxiety. My blood pressure, my heart rate, I kept checking my pulse because it was so high. I was literally like shaking the entire game. Every big play we had, I was shaking. I was holding Dee Dee. We were jumping up and down. And I think that's why she's so tired today because she had a... <laughs> She had a very high energy evening last night and she's still recovering from it. Yeah, she has no words. All right, let's get into the stats of the game. So the Seahawks ended up winning 17 to 20 in the final seconds of the game. Now, I know all the Seahawks, they love to give us a nail biter game all the way the way up to the very end. And they continue to do that for us. All right, so here's some numbers. We only the numbers aren't very good. <laughs> Our numbers don't really show that we should have won, but it was a low scoring game on both ends. So this it makes total sense. We had 297 total yards, 197 passing and only 100 rushing. All right. Let's talk about Drew Locke. Drew Locke didn't know he was going to play. It was very confusing up until the very start of the game. Like I kept Googling, is Jalen Hurts playing because he was sick? I kept Googling, is Juno Smith playing because his groin? And there wasn't a very clear answer until actual start of the game. I got mixed signals because there was some sort of article saying that they activated a practice squad quarterback to active roster. And so I was like, okay, Gino's not playing. But then they activated him. So I was just very confused. It was a very confusing start of the game. Lots of mixed signals. 
no communication from the media or from the Seahawks. <laughs> but Drew Locke ended up playing. He was 23 for 33 with 208 yards and one touchdown. I was listening to his post-game conference, post-game interview, whatever you call it, and he was saying, you know, he didn't know if he was playing, but he had the mentality and the mindset that he was playing, which probably helped him a lot. Going into this game, obviously last week against the Niners, he had he got some reps in. He got a taste of that Niners defense. He got a taste of playing away out of Lumen Field, which if you've ever been to Seattle, ever been to a Seahawks game, home game, it is one of the best experiences ever. The crowd is great. The crowd is loud. The crowd didn't sound like the crowd at Levi Stadium last week, that's for sure. So I'm pretty sure that kind of made him feel better too. He got some reps in the week before and he was mentally prepared to go into this game to actually play. He did pretty well. You can tell that some of the connection to some of his receivers wasn't completely there. His throws, some of them were overthrown. Some of them were a little bit late. Some of them were a little bit low. But I think that those reps, he kept getting better and better and better, which obviously at the end of the game when he threw the game-winning touchdown to JSN and kind of just proved like that, that touchdown, oh my God, that was chef's kiss okay Kenneth Walker also had a touchdown as well he had 19 carries for 86 yards I was happy to see him perform today I, I think the last few games or he hasn't really had a lot of touches we've been seeing a lot of Charbonnet we've been seeing a lot of other people but I feel like Walker stepped up and he actually did very well DK was our leading receiver which you wouldn't have guessed until the very end of the game he had only five receptions for 78 yards but the very very last drive of the game DK showed up and played. He was pretty much locked down the entire game. Um, he might have one good reception in the first quarter, and then he was silent for the second and third, and then the, until the very last drive of the fourth quarter. But he showed up when we needed him to. He helped us drive the ball down the field to prepare us for that final touchdown to JSN. So awesome job, DK. I'm glad you showed up to play. So our offense looked good. I feel like we finally were starting to connect with our receivers. The Eagles defense was tough though. The one-on-one matchups, they were getting us and they were they were just out there. I feel like their defense was just scrappy. Their defense was, they were just scrappy. They were out there, they were quick. And so I think Lockett probably had one of his worst games of the season, lots of dropped balls. He looked a little frustrated. I don't know if there was just a miscommunication with certain things, but he didn't have his best game. All right, defense. Oof. Our defense actually showed up to play. Two words for you. Julian Love. Julian Love had two interceptions, and I think these interceptions were huge interceptions, in which if he didn't get those interceptions, we would have lost the game probably by at least a couple touchdowns, right? Because his interceptions were just... One was in the end zone. Was two in the end zone? At least one was in the end zone, and the second one was pretty much... Julian Love had two huge interceptions, which were game changing for us. I don't know. He was just all over the field. I felt like he was hustling. He, I felt like he was reading the ball and just reacting a lot better than some of the other defenders that we have. Another person that was, had a great, great, great game was Leonard Williams. He was all over the field as well too. And he's a big boy and those big boys can move. It was funny, as we were watching the game and you're watching these DNs, these defensive linemen going after the person with the ball, I looked over at my friends and I was like, I would be terrified if any of these guys were running at me because one, they're giant, they're tall, they probably are like over 300 pounds or, you know, but they're quick, they're fast. So I just, I don't know, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. So Julian Love, Leonard Williams, they're, you're, you're my defensive players of the game. So Jamal Adams was out per usual. I feel like Jamal's is one of those inconsistent players on our team who's always hurt. But all in all, I feel like our defense seemed a little bit more cohesive. Our secondary was a little bit slow. I looked over at my friend. He played college football and I asked him, do safeties usually just stand there and watch people catch the ball and then react? And he said no. So I was like, okay, <laughs> why are we doing that? So that's one of the questions I had. So we were watching people catch the passes. Our tackling was still, we're just tackling with arms. Like I don't understand why we're just like trying to like grab people with our arms instead of using our bodies. It's almost like we're trying to prematurely tackle people. I mean, I don't know how to tackle anybody, but I'm pretty sure you're not just supposed to use your arms. Pretty sure you're supposed to use, use your whole body. So let's get that going, people. But all in all, I feel like our defense looked a lot better. We looked a little bit more hyped. I feel like we had a little bit more energy and a little bit more just intensity out there. And I liked it. 
I liked it a lot. We need more of that. After the game, I had a lot of Niners fans that are my friends texting me saying, go Hawks, go Seahawks. And I loved it. <laughs> Even though they obviously wanted us to win for their benefit, because if the Seahawks won, the Niners would have an advantage over the Eagles. So now the Niners have a better record than the Eagles. So obviously that's why they're cheering for the Seahawks. But I honestly loved it. And I was soaking it up all day long. <laughs> but one thing that is very interesting, one of my friends, I'm going to name his name. His name is Sam. Sam is a huge San Francisco sports fan in general. He told me, and I quote, still not sure if the Niners can win a game like y'all did tonight. And I was like, I was like, really? And he was like, yeah, because, and this is a good point. He's like, the Niners haven't proven that they can come from behind against teams in the late in the games, which makes sense because they've been blowing teams out left and right. Like, I would like to see what their total points scored is this season because it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. But I mean, I feel like if you're blowing teams out, you don't really need to worry about winning at the last moment. So, but they do have a big game coming up on Christmas. They're playing the Ravens at home and the Ravens already clinched their spot in the playoffs. So, and then they have the commanders, which should be a, an easy win. And then they have the Rams, which any, any division game is always a tough one, right? The Rams are always doing really well right now as well. So we need the Rams to lose because we're tied with them right now. And, you know, tiebreaker goes to the team who's beat you and they beat us both times. We played them this season already. So rooting for the Niners to beat the Rams, rooting for the Rams to lose. Yeah. So we're currently tied with the Rams. We need them to lose. All right, going into next week's game, week 16, which is crazy to say, the Seahawks are going to Tennessee and playing the Titans at home. The Titans are five and nine, which I do not want to go into this game being like, oh, we're playing a five and nine team. The Seahawks have a tendency to play down to teams' levels, right? And we can't do that this time. We need to keep this energy high. We need to keep this energy going. We need to go in and we need to win. We need to win the next three games. No more losing. We need to go in and win the next three games. I don't know. I just feel like we played really well as a team this last game, but we need a little bit more, right? We need to tackle more. We need to make more completions, and we just need to continue to get better every single game. The last three games, let's finish out strong because we want to at least try to make the playoffs, right? Let's just try. Let's just try our best. Let's just try. Please, please, please. All right, everybody's favorite segment, best dressed, best game day fit. Seahawks, I think you heard me. I think you're listening to me because you gave me more outfits this week than you did last week. So thank you. Shout out to the Seahawks, whoever runs our social media. If you saw me, if you heard me, I really appreciate you. All right. So there was two that really caught my eye. One of them was Daryl Taylor. He was wearing this gray plaid suit with a blue tie and blue kicks. And I think that just went really well with his pink hair. It was just a great color contrast color coordination whatever you want to call it the second person that caught my eye was Kobe Bryant Kobe Bryant came in wearing this like pinstripe suit super fly super clean with I think it was like black patent leather shoes or leather shoes whatever you want to call it you know and you know I love a suit you know me I love a good suit especially on game day so it was a toss-up between those two but I'm going to award the winner for week 15's best dressed, best game day fit to Daryl Taylor. I don't know. I think it's just something about the blue and the pink in your hair that just stood out to me the most in the simple gray plaid suit. I love it. I love it so much. I wish there was like a mandatory day where all the players had to wear suits because y'all would look fly. Nothing like a man in a suit. <laughs> We're going to add a new segment to the show, and it's going to be, you know, I thought about it, but one of my buddies sent me a text with a great question. So I'm just, just going to call this question of the day, question of the show, question of the show. So today's question is, my friend Corey texted me this. Today's question of the day is, if Gina was healthy next week, who are you starting? And I think that's a question in a lot of people's minds, right? If Gino is healthy, is he going to start next week? Or did Drew prove himself? 
Like, I know every sports team is run differently, but man, like listening to Drew Locke's postgame interview, he mentioned that Gino is an unsung hero to him, meaning Gino has helped him. The last couple weeks, just giving him tips, helping him out, watching film, giving him pep talks, like just helping him out to prepare him for these games, which as a teammate you should do, especially for your backup, but... It almost makes me wonder, is Gino a better coach than a player? And I know that, oh gosh, but in my very own opinion, I feel like, you know, Drew Locke is starting to figure it out. He's starting to build his confidence again. He's starting to get reps in. He hasn't played, and he mentioned that he hasn't played for a minute. So from not playing to go onto the field, and like especially Monday Night Football, especially going against the Niners last week, those are I mean, you're playing on the biggest stage you can as a football player, let alone you're playing against one of the best teams in the NFL right now. And then you're playing another great team on Monday Night Football. I don't know how you can get your confidence from not playing and then just jumping right into it. So I feel like he's starting to figure it out. He's getting his reps in. He's building his confidence. And OK, let, let me just answer this question. If Gino is healthy next week, who am, who am I starting? I would start Drew Locke. I honestly would start Drew Locke. I feel like he's motivated I feel like he wants to win and I feel like he's coachable I feel like he's learning yeah just his mentality I think on the field and off the field he's just hype and you know and I know there's this video going around jokingly about like him as when he was a Bronco he's on the sideline like rapping the song but I like it I like that kind of I don't know I like it if you can be on the sideline like hyping your team up really feeling what's going on like you're in the moment and you're feeling good I I like it. So I would start, I would start Drew Luck. Let me know who you would start, Gino or Drew. Let me know. All right, y'all, we're going into this next week. It is Christmas. It is the holiday season. I am flying back to Seattle this weekend, so we will not have an episode next week. But who knows? Maybe you'll catch me on another podcast in Seattle. We'll see. All right, so I'll see you in the new year. Happy holidays and a happy new year. Love you. Bye.